great honor to be here. Yeah, I've always wanted to come to a Dazer, but living in the Midwest, it makes it difficult. So, uh, My topic is <clears throat> art as a way of thinking in science. And I'm gonna propose two basic theses. One is that arts and sciences share common ways of thinking. And two, that the arts can therefore help to train creative scientific minds. I'll start by looking at my own practices and then explore briefly the evidence combining artist, that combining artistic and scientific thinking is not only quite common, but unusually fecund. I was fortunate to be introduced to biology at the age of 10 through the giant book, Golden Book of Biology, with its wonderful illustrations by Charlie Harper. Harper's ability to reduce complex materials such as Darwin's study of the Galapagos finches to abstract images of tremendous intellectual power and beauty fed into my own combined loves of nature and art. I would later stumble upon a quote from Mitchell Feigenbaum, who was one of the inventors of the modern mathematics of chaos theory and an inveterate art gallery devotee. And his quote explained the power of Harper's abstractions. Feigenbaum said, quote, it's abundantly obvious that one doesn't know the world around us in detail. Trying to model it in detail is wrong. What artists have accomplished is realizing that there's only a small amount of stuff that's important and then seeing what it was. So they can do some of my research for me, end quote. Artists often purify what and how we perceive to reveal the essences. As an undergraduate at Princeton University, I then had the good fortune to fall into the hands of Bob Langridge, the first scientist to model macromolecules such as DNA on a computer. And about that time, Langridge captured the cover of science with dual images comparing the beauty of the DNA molecule, looked end on here, with the beauty of a stained glass window. Many of Langridge's colleagues wanted to know why he wasted valuable space on mere art when he could have portrayed more data. But Langridge was pleased that his students all got the point that great scientists should be as beautiful as great art. So thus encouraged, I've used my artistic approach to doing science. All of my research involves molecular and higher order forms of complementarity in which each figure defines the shapes of another. Base pairing between nucleotides is one form of molecular complementarity. Ligand receptor specificity, substrate enzyme, antigen antibody recognition are other well-known forms. But my own research suggests that such well-known types of complementarity only scratch the surface of the possibilities that evolution has explored, and that these wider, wider possibilities explain the process by which what we call interactomes, shown on the right, which characterize all cellular systems, may have evolved. And indeed, much of my research into complementarity is artistic, as illustrated on the left. I explore through cut paper constructions how simple evolutionary rules govern changes introduced into a system of complementary interactions. When I'm lucky, the results work purely as art, but they also reveal the principles by which the science works. Happily, some of the editors of journals like this artistic approach enough to use it as cover art or as illustrations accompanying my publications, and in this case, chemistry and industry, was nice enough to do both for an article I wrote on molecular paleontology, which is basically about the idea that this selection system is embedded in the molecules we now see so that we can look back in time at how they evolved. I've even taken to collaborating with a professional transmedia artist, Adam W. Brown, who specializes in adapting scientific materials and methods to produce new forms of art. This image shows two views of our installation, Origins of Life 1.4, which has been exhibited now at a number of galleries around the world. It consists of a reimagining of the famous Stanley Miller origins of life experiment in which he exposed a primordial atmospheric gases to electrical discharges to synthesize amino acids. We have aestheticized it and transformed the apparatus 
into a functional sculpture that bubbles, sparks, booms, and flows in sensual ways so that viewers can literally feel what it's like to do the science. And we also carry out, in public, novel experiments. So the art becomes a way to perform, literally, new science. Now, I have to confess that I spent quite a bit of my career wondering if what I was doing was completely unusual and idiosyncratic. Very few of my fellow students and very few of my colleagues or professors seemed to share my twin interests, let alone to combine them as I was doing. So I started in graduate school looking for like minds. I was fortunate enough to stumble upon an essay called Imagination in Science by J. H. Van Hoff who was the first Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. He linked his own scientific creativity to his many avocations, and these included playing the flute at a semi-professional level, drawing and painting, and writing poetry in five different languages. The drawing of the house on the left or upper left, by the way, was done when he was a mere 12 years old. Van Hoff went further. In his essay, he wanted to know whether his personal experiences were generalizable. So he began, as I was doing, reading biographies and autobiographies. And from this unusual type of research, Van Hoff proposed that the most imaginative scientists always displayed their imaginative ability and perhaps even developed it through other creative activities. So <clears throat> out of graduate school, I decided to test Van Hoff's hypothesis more formally. I and my collaborators have now performed several very large scale studies strongly suggesting that he was generally correct. Here are some of the results of one of those studies where we have looked at adult avocations of the general public, members of the Sigma Xi, which is the research society, so it basically represents a selection of fairly typical scientists, the US National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, and all the Nobel Prize winners up until 2001. The long and short of it is that the more likely uh, a scientist is to engage in activities such as arts and poetry and writing uh, plays and things like that, as an adult, the greater they are uh, likely to become a Nobel laureate or a member of the National Academy. Nobel laureates are, for example, 15 to 25 times more likely than Sigma Xi members to engage as adults in fine arts, crafts, creative writing, and performing. These are very, very large differences. Statistics, however, can be misleading, as we know, and correlations don't reveal uh, causation. So I wanted to go beyond the numbers and look at what scientific uh, artists were actually doing and why they were doing it. Many scientists have let, left accounts that provide these causal links. And here's one. Alexis Carroll, who won a Nobel Prize for developing the surgical stitching techniques required to permit organ transplantation, wrote in his autobiography that the inspiration for his innovations stemmed from his training as a lace maker that his mother gave him as a child. Similarly, Dorothy Hodgkin attributed some of her scientific ability to the artistic training that she was given as a girl. She excelled in her arts to the extent that her parents actually trusted her starting at the age of 16 to do their professional illustrations for their archeological publications. From these artistic studies, Hodgkin wrote that I began to think of the restraints imposed by two-dimensional order in a plane. Further studies at London Museums when she was a chemistry major at Oxford University then extended these contemplations to the rules governing three-dimensional symmetries. The result was a mind that was very well uh, trained to be strong in three-dimensional pattern recognition, imaging, and mapping all the skills that she needed to pioneer her Nobel Prize winning work in X-ray crystallography. The Painting on the left, uh, or on the right, by the way, is her painting of her X-ray crystallographic data on insulin. So she also loved the beauty of it. Robert R. Wilson, physicist, provides another example. He found similarities between artistic and scientific thinking. He said, in designing an accelerator, 
I proceed very much as I do in making a sculpture. I felt that just as theory is beautiful, so too is a scientific instrument, or that it should be. The lines should be graceful, the volumes balanced. I hope that the chain of accelerators, the experiments too, in fact, and the utilities that actually provide the power for them should be strongly but simply expressed as objects of intrinsic beauty. If one thing is clearly said, it is that there is much in common between what the creative artist does and what the creative scientist does. Ned Seaman, another physicist, biologist, perceives the same kinds of similarities between the processes of arts and sciences as Wilson. Seaman is one of the founders of nanochemistry. He says that his insights often come from studying artists such as M.C. Escher, who explore structure and symmetry. To be sure, he says, quote, one can learn a vast amount about a molecule from staring at an accurate model of it. More importantly, however, we can come up with a new structural ideas about DNA from looking at it, as well as thinking about it as something that is not DNA, something such as paintings or sculptures. They look different, they make us think differently about it, and as a structural scientist, I have found that these differences can lead to interesting notions and even experiments and new paths to explore. Finally, we can take my argument one step further. If art is so important to scientific thinking, then shouldn't artists be able to make significant scientific contributions? The answer is a resounding yes. As JD mentioned, I'm writing a book about the subject of artists, performers, musicians, and so forth as discoverers and inventors. And one of the people I'm featuring is Jonathan Kingdon, whose work is shown here. His only degree is a Master of Fine Arts. He's an internationally known artist, mainly of uh, subjects from Africa. Kingdon's second life, however, is as a faculty member of Oxford University's zoology department. He's one of the world's experts on the evolution of a group of monkeys called Gwenins, as well as a pioneer in biogeographical and evolutionary studies of large mammals in Africa. For him, he, there is no difference between doing art and science, for the primary methods, he says, are the same. Any drawing, he says, poses questions and problems that you have to solve. Drawing is a way of exploring. Scientists have lots of techniques. They make histograms, graphs, tables. These techniques are no different than drawing. Drawing is just as scientific. And here he's showing abstractions of Gwenin faces in order to understand how the facial coloring patterns were related to each other through evolution. Too much detail can disturb our ability to see the essences. And so we're back to Charlie Harper's Finch abstractions of the Galapagos. That, that Darwin studied. All of which is to say that the many very su successful scientists, and I could give dozens of additional examples, as well as artists turned scientists, have recognized explicitly the value of artistic thinking for scientific progress. The late Cyril Stanley Smith of MIT may have stated this point most clearly when he said, I have slowly come to realize that the analytical quantitative approach that I had been taught to regard as the only respectable one for a scientist is insufficient. The richest aspects of any large and complicated system arise from factors that cannot be measured easily, if at all. For these, the artist's approach, uncertain though it may be, seems to find and convey more meaning. So what I want to conclude with here is a choice that we face both personally, educationally, and as a society. It's a choice that I can't put into words, so I've drawn it. Basically, these are the disciplines. Each one has its own style, its own language, its own content. They spend a lot of time trying to be different from each other. But imagine if we could think about the processes and the ways we know things in an integrated way so we can see them all in the same basic style. But look at them carefully. Look at those shapes because there's another level that we can get to as well.
Thank you.